of our honor for the Word of God. John chapter 4, beginning of verse 1. Really, the whole chapter essentially is an incident in the life of Jesus, but we will be looking at part of that, and so we'll be reading verses 1 through 15 of John chapter 4. Hear then God's word. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. But he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria that is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it was who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water shall give him, that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. The grass withers, the flower fades, the word of God endures forever. Amen. Please be seated. In our passage, Jesus offers water, living water. We have here the imagery used of a thirst, a real thirst, a physical thirst, but it is used to speak of a thirst of the soul. We sang from Psalm 42, As the heart longs for flowing streams, so longs my soul for you, O God. And we all know that longing, when we are thirsty, we've been out and it's been hot and we've been sweating, and, and we come in and we desire a drink of cool, fresh water. And there he is in life a desire in the souls of men and women and children. We seek something that will satisfy, that will define us, that will give to us the heart's desire. It was an early church father, Augustine, who spoke of that desire, that need, as he said of God, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. A restlessness, seeking to find something that will fill a void. And we know that people try to fill it with all sorts of things. They seek to fill it with knowledge. They seek to fill it with entertainment. They seek to fill it with ease and wealth. They seek to fill it with prestige and importance, and yet all of these things fall short. And Jesus is offering living water. We want to see and stand amazed at, at Jesus' interaction with this Samaritan woman, a most unlikely candidate for Jesus to interact with, and yet he does. How 
is it that he comes into this circumstance? Well, we see that there is providential direction in Jesus' life. Jesus knew his ministry, his task. You know, as he lives his life, there are providences that direct him, that he might be faithful. We think, first of all, we see the providence of, of the publicity that Jesus is gaining. We read in verse 1, Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. You see, this was still fairly early in Jesus' ministry. And he was not at the point. He knew that his ministry was not yet at the point where this sort of attention and the crowds and the confrontation was the right time. And therefore, he withdraws. Yes, he has been active. He has been speaking. He has been calling men and women to repentance. His disciples have been baptizing them, a baptism of repentance parallel to John's. But Jesus then goes back to Galilee. But providentially again, Jesus must go through Samaria. And as he goes through Samaria, he walks. He came poor and humble. He did not have a horse, a carriage, a chariot. He walks. And as he walks through the dry land, he becomes weary and thirsty. And he sits down at a well that is along the way. And he comes then to the town of Sychar, and there he sits down at the well. All of this in God's providence. And he is sitting there, his disciples go off to get food. And you can tell that they probably are a little nervous. This is, in a sense, enemy territory. And so they all go together, there's strength in number. And Jesus is left alone. No doubt he has sent them. And they feel secure then and go to buy food. And as Jesus sits there, this woman comes in the middle of the day. And Jesus addresses her. And, and we don't think much of it. He asks her for a drink. He's thirsty. We think that's not so unusual, not so abnormal. But we need to understand in that time, in that day, that this was a woman of Samaria. Now the Samaritans, what was their origin? Why was there an animosity by the Jews against the Samaritans? Well, the Samaritans had their origin in those whom the Assyrian Empire in the long distance, past distance, had displaced the people of the northern tribes of Israel. And they had taken on some of the worship of God out of fear because they had encountered some disasters and they thought, well, we need to know who the God was in this land. And, and there were some prophets sent by the Assyrians, and they instructed the people how they were to worship God, and they, they were syncretists. They worshiped God, and they worshiped their own gods. And they established themselves there, and they claimed to be on par with the Israelites, with those who returned from the Babylonian captivity. But they had a corrupted worship, and they said, we have to worship on this mountain, Mount Gerizim. And the Jews said, no, Jerusalem is the only place where we may worship. And there was an animosity that developed that many Jews, if they had to go to Galilee, they would go around, taking significantly longer and go around instead of going through Samaria. And there was a bitter hatred. They would not share anything. And then you begin to understand why the woman is surprised. 
that Jesus asks her for a drink. You see that in her response. We think even more than that. Here is a woman who comes to the well in the middle of the day when it's hot. Why does she come then? Well, maybe she ran out of water. More likely, as we find out her circumstance, she was an outcast. She would be talked about. And she didn't go when the rest of the women would come to get their water, but she waited till no one would likely be at the well. And yet Jesus is there. In the providence of God, in the knowledge and direction of Jesus himself, because this is part of his ministry. This particular incident. And you think about how, how John draws this out. How he carefully records this conversation. How he expands on it that we might be focused upon it and say, what is going on here? Jesus is teaching something that is true not only for this woman, but for every one of you, for me. This woman comes and she expresses her surprise. And John, the writer of the gospel, inserts, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. But Jesus answers, if you knew the gift of God, and the one who asks you, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Jesus is engaging her. He does not despise her, reject her, turn his back and say, wait till she's gone. He engages her with truth. You see, this woman, as all people, have an emptiness in their heart if it is not filled with God. A love for God. The Spirit of God. And he is pointing to that as he raises this response with her. There is something more that can be had. She has come for water, and, and Jesus is talking about living water. Now, what's the difference there? Jesus is raising this first, and she might think, well, you know, all water is living water in the sense we need water to live. But she approaches it on a more practical level. Though she should have known, she should have picked up on, there is something unique, something different being offered here. But she asks Jesus, she interacts, and she says, I don't have anything to draw water with. She looks, he's sitting there all by himself. She knows this well. She comes here often, and she knows that it's deep, and unless you've got some rope and some bucket, something to, to lift up the water, you're not going to be able to get it. And so Jesus is offering her water, but he has no means to get it. And she asks him, where then do you get that living water? And because this is a well that was the well of Jacob, who dug it. She thinks, Jacob gave us this well and we have the water. Now, if you're going to give water and it's not going to come from this well, well, are you greater than Jacob who gave us this well? See, this would be necessary. If you're going to give us something better than water that we need to live every day, are you greater than Jacob? He was a patriarch. He was one of those who was the origin, the source of the Israelites, of the knowledge of God. And she asks that question. And Jesus continues to explain to her. He wants to maintain her interest, draw her in. Do we already begin to see their instruction for ourselves when we interact with people? 
Do we know the living water within us? Do we seek ways to present it to others that we want to draw them in? Conversation that, that points not to us, but to our Savior. When people say to you, you're such a good person, hopefully they say that. If we live faithfully as Christians, then people will say, you're such a good person. There's an opportunity to begin to draw people in, to ask them, well, what is good? Why do you say that? Or if they say that of our children, your children are so good, they're so well behaved. And we say, oh yeah, I'm a good parent, no wonder. Or, or do we begin to say, what is the source of that? What do we look for? To begin to draw them in, to, to say, how is it that children can be different? That my life is different? To seek an opportunity to present more of the truth. And this is what Jesus does as, as he continues this interaction. And Jesus picks up on that living water that she has just thought, well, if you're going to draw water, you don't have any source. Are you greater? And Jesus, in, es in essence, is saying, yes, I am greater. There is a water. Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. As you can imagine that this woman is thinking, what is he talking about? What does he mean? The water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up unto everlasting life. You see how Jesus is, is in a sense raising the stakes? It's not a water that's going to satisfy you for a week. It's, it's, it's going to be something that expands, that is a source of eternal life. There is a qualitative difference. Not simply an amount of water, but a different kind of water. It is water of life. Water that can spring up. And it is Jesus who is the one able to give it. And therefore, Jesus, in, in explaining, notice that there is a contrast as well. It's not an external water. This woman came to the well, and, and she put down her bucket. She drew it up and gained water. But Jesus is saying it's not external. Notice what he says. It will become in him a fountain of water springing up into eternal life. It is not something external, something that is given to us and now we have. It is something internal. This woman came again and again to the well. And Jesus speaking of a living water that would be within her, that would satisfy, that would spring up, that would well, that would flow to eternal life. And it is Jesus who gives this. Now, not surprisingly, perhaps, we say, well, this woman was a little dense. What is she focused on again? What do we focus on so often again? We say, yes, there are riches in Christ Jesus. And people say, well, um, my bank account is still poor. We say, you've missed the whole point. You don't believe in Jesus so that you can get rich. But this woman, notice in her response, the woman says to Jesus, Sir, give me this water. Why? So that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. She was thinking, boy, this would be a great life. I wouldn't have to come all the way to the well, draw up that heavy water and lug it all the way back home again and again. She's focused on the external. 
She thinks, yes, this would make my life easier. And what is it today that we seek, that so many seek? My life would be perfect if. And this is what so many seek. They, they want something to fill that. There is a void and they think, if only I could have the right circumstance, the right job. If only I can have the right children, the way that I want them to be. If only I can, all these things. But it's the water that does not satisfy the soul. And Jesus is trying to get this woman to recognize that. He is speaking about something more. And, and we'll see how Jesus does that further when we look at more of it, because he suddenly changes topics. Remember he says, go get your husband, and it opens up a whole new venue. But here Jesus is drawing attention to the fact that here is a need but he uses it to represent that spiritual thirst. And he speaks of living water. Not water that gives life, but living water that springs up within a person to eternal life. And we say, this is something different. It is not water that we can drink in. It must be something internal to us. And we know from the rest of the scripture, from the New Testament, that Jesus is speaking of himself. That Jesus is that water that satisfies our longing. For Jesus is our avenue to God. God made us for fellowship with himself. And if we seek it elsewhere, we will find it does not satisfy. We might think of it as, well, you know, there's still water, but imagine it was salt water. You're thirsty and you say, oh, that's the only water available. I'm going to drink it. And it's salt water. Does that help? No, it makes it worse. You say, well, I've drunk it. I've felt it going down my throat. And so it is with all the things of this world. This woman, no doubt, would have said, you know, if only I could change this and this and this in my life, it would be wonderful. But here she was. She had tried so much. And we are instructed that there is a need. There is an emptiness. There is a restlessness in every person. Why does that help us to know that? Well, we need to focus on ourselves first and say, am I restless? Am I seeking something? Do I think something outside of myself will, will make me happy, contented, give me meaning and purpose? We need to say, Jesus talked about something internal, something within. And that is Jesus himself that we would be one with him by faith, that we would know that living water, that we would know that water that cleanses and washes us, that enables us to come before God and say, Father, the God of heaven and earth, the God who is infinite, unchanging, perfect in his power, knowledge, wisdom, and we may come to him and say, Father, because we have that living water in Jesus Christ, we think of so many who do not know that water internally, that living water, and we need to seek to engage people to ask those bigger questions. As we have opportunity, we deal with somebody who has done well in 
life and they have a big bank account. They have the resources and how do we engage them? We can ask them, what happens to all your stuff when you die? You see, it's trying to give a perspective. This is what Jesus is doing to this woman. Yes, here's water, and, and I'm talking about a source. And, and what do you want? You want to have it so that you wouldn't have to be bothered with this in your life anymore. But there is something that has to be internal, a change, a source that is without limit, that can only be God. You see, it is as we have known the love of God in Christ Jesus that we know the refreshment of living water. Peter talks about times of refreshing when he talks about the coming of Jesus, the pouring out of the Spirit. Times of refreshing when we say, here at last I may rest. Here I may find a settledness. Here I may find a hope that is not dependent on the externals. But he is God dwelling in me. There is the hope. And it is then out of this spring of life, of life-giving water, as we experience and we may see it flow out to others, that as we have known grace, we may experience giving of grace to others. As we know forgiveness, we may forgive. But it begins with understanding our own need. It begins with knowing that there is something more. You see, this is what Jesus has been pointing to all the time. If you knew the gift of God, if you knew the one who was speaking to you, there's something more than simply coming here and finding an easier way to get water. There's something more. And he talks about water, not just satisfying our thirst here and now, but there is a living water that will satisfy forever, that flows up to everlasting life. Do you know that which is greater than your present living, your circumstances? Do you know that fellowship with God that gives a refreshing, a settledness that you say, I am whole because I have my Savior. This is where we find our rest. And we see that reflected in the book of Revelation when heaven is pictured. What do we find? <clears throat> Revelation chapter 21, verse 6. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. Here is the promise of Jesus. And we see in Revelation chapter 22 as heaven is pictured. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. You see, it is not in ourselves it is not in our environment. It comes from God. It comes from the Lamb who poured out His life that we might have life. And so Jesus engages this woman. He does not despise her because she is a woman, which many Jews did. He does not despise her because she is a Samaritan, a sworn enemy of the Jews. Because
because he knows her as a sinner in need of living water, in need of the grace of God that he is in Jesus Christ. And therefore he presents himself to her. And he will say to her when she speaks to the Messiah, I am he. Do we have a love like that for other people? The most unlikely candidate Jesus engages because his kingdom is not going to be a Jewish kingdom. He is going to have a kingdom that expands to all the world. People from every tongue and tribe and nation will be brought into his kingdom. And you and me, we are brought into that kingdom by finding Jesus as that living fountain of living water that springs up within us as we experience the unfathomable love of God. As we think that the perfect God would provide salvation for me, a sinner, and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And we marvel and say, here is something worth living for. Here is something worth dying for because I have everlasting life. Yes, my life here in the end, on the earth will end, but I will continue in heaven with my God forever and ever. What a glory, what a hope. And Jesus is setting this before this woman, drawing her in, explaining to her, seeking to pique her interest so that he may set before her the truth. May we know that truth and may we desire to draw others to it and use opportunities that God gives us in his providence. This was a providence of God in Jesus' life. He had to leave Judea. He had to go through Samaria. Here was the well and he sits there and he seizes the opportunity and he presents living water. He presents himself. May God give us many opportunities to do that as well. To the praise and glory of his name. Amen. Let us pray. Our God in heaven, as we think of the ministry of Jesus, we are reminded in this passage that he did not seek out those who were rich and comfortable in this world so that he went to those who were the most unlikely. This woman of Samaria, whom he will expose as a sinner, and yet his love for her caused him to engage her in conversation, to set truth before her, to set hope before her. Oh Lord, may our hearts reflect that of our Savior, and may we who have tasted of that living water tell others that here is the hope, here is the rest, here is the glory of all men found in Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. In response, let us turn to hymn number 304. I heard the voice of Jesus say, let's